Grab your Bibles and go to the book of Matthew chapter 26. I will be talking um, there for this morning. And just so you know, um, we're doing this sermon today in a two-part series. Um, there's so much in this text to extract by way of application that uh, we can't get it all out in one setting. So I will come back to that next week. So today, just going to share just some principles that I want to extract from that to helpfully um, strengthen us so we can be encouraged to be who God would have us to be. Does anybody in here believe, we've been on this series for a while, and we're probably going to be here a little bit longer, so I'm hope, hoping we're not boring you, right? Anybody believe prayer changes things? I mean, sure enough, right? Sure enough, sure enough, yeah. I don't want to steal, I don't want to steal nobody's thunder, but um, this morning, uh, this morning, and I won't give you detail, I'll just say generally, in between service, uh, somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, prayer do change things. And here's their story, right? We were in this major financial dilemma. We had to make a tough decision, and they came and spoke to me about it um, a few months back. And they said to me, we just want you to know that God heard and answered your prayer and we appreciate the counsel that you gave, right? And here's the end of that. I mean, that financial situation got rectified where they got blessed beyond their socks. If I told you all the number, it'll freak you out. That's God. That's my point, right? But prayer changes things, right? I was shocked, man. I was shocked when it was sitting there. I'm like, whoa, God did that? Man, I need to pray for me, you know? <laughs> But that's the kind of God we serve. He's an awesome God. Now, I'm saying that to say, most of you, if you've been in church any length of time, like I have been in church a long time, and when you've been in church, um, been part of the Christian community, you hear a lot of things. You hear a lot of things, right? I have heard people say when it comes to the issue of prayer that if your prayer is not being answered, it's probably because you don't have enough faith. Y'all ever heard that one? Come on. Then I've even heard people say that if you pray long enough and you pray hard enough, you stand the possibility of obligating God to your will and that God must respond. I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff, right, as it relates to who God is or what God wants to do. But I want to stand before you this morning and say that when we go to God in prayer, we need to understand it's not so much about our desire as it is about his will. Come on, say amen if you believe that, right? I, I, we, we, I, need, I need to flesh it out with you a little bit because as we talk more about prayer, we must understand that when we pray to God, God is in control. That's very, very important. I have a grandson that's been spending the weekend with me, and this little guy is two years old, and man, he can manipulate me. He can. He can. I mean, he, my, my wife's word, he's got you wrapped around his thumb, Right? That little boy, he don't even have to pray. He just got to come to me, Grandpa, and give me them big booby eyes and all, whatever you want. Right? And some of us think sometimes we can approach God like that. And some of us think that we can manipulate God and get God to do whatever we want done. So this passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, I believe it is a perfect example of how to pray in accordance with God's will, and then more importantly, to submit to God once God responds, right? That's very, very difficult for us to do because if I have needs and I have desires, I expect as a believer I can go to God, and God, because I'm a child, because I'm faithful, because I tithe, because I stay holy, because I do the things that God wants me to do, that he owes me something. <laughs> Don't make that mistake. Are you with me? So I want us to look at this text, and I want us to look at this passage to see what it's saying for us. So it said Matthew chapter 26. And just briefly by way of literary context, let me just kind of walk you through what the passage is about. Then we're going to get to the few verses that I want to extrapolate and point to you. This, this in chapter 26, Jesus is at the end of his earthly journey, his earthly ministry. He had been ministering now for three years on the earth doing what God has called him to do. And now he's at the end of his journey, and he's communicating to his disciples what the series of events that's about to take place. So 26 opens up with the, the elders and the religious leaders plotting to kill Jesus. Now what's striking about that is Jesus had already prophesied to his disciples that the end is near and his time is at hand. So as we see that the chief priests are plotting, but they refuse to kill him um, because of the celebration of Passover that was going on. They wanted to wait until after that. 
So as Jesus is making this entry, um, we see that he's then anointed in Bethany with this very, very expensive anointment by this woman who's anointing him. Then we get down to verse 14, you notice that the betrayer, Judas, steps in, and Judas now sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. How ridiculous is that, right? And then after Judas sells him out by betraying him, verse 17 picks up where he celebrates the Passover meal, or like we would refer to it as the Last Supper with his disciples, he is making a pathway down, and he tells him to go make preparation. And then you get down to around verse 28, and we see him now eating this Passover meal with the disciples, where he took bread and he broke it and blessed it, and he gave them a meal, and they celebrated this, this, this Passover or Seder meal together. But then look at verse 30. When you get to verse 30, verse 30 speaks now to the end of the meal. And this is a passage that if you've been in church, I don't know about other denominations, but in the Baptist denomination, this is a famed phrase, right? It says this in verse uh, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Y'all ever heard that before? And then church would be dismissed, right? But, But that phrase now is the setting for what we're going to be talking about This evening, because it is after they had sung the hymn, and while they were on the way to the Mount of Olives, that Jesus lays the foundation with his disciples for what we're going to see and what we're going to encounter this morning. It was on that journey that he said to them that um, that in a short while you're going to betray me, and this is important information for when we pick it up next week. And you know vociferous Peter, right? Peter is saying to Jesus, hey, you might be talking about Andrew. You might be talking about John. You might be talking about Bartholomew. You might be talking about Judas, what he already did. But I will never betray you. Y'all know this. Jesus responds to Peter and says to him, before the rooster crows, how many times? He says, you're going to deny me. And, of course, Peter, listen to what he's saying. God, there's no way on God's earth that I'm going to do that. You're going to hear this come up extensively next week as we dig into this text a little bit. But, but it's on that that as the journey continues, we see now they're on their way to the Mount of Olives. And when verse 36 picks up, they arrive to their destination. So let me read this for you. Notice what it says in verse 36. It says, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there to pray. And taking with him, it says, Peter and the two um, disciples, uh, sons of Zebedee, thank you, he began to be sorrowful, okay, and troubled. And it says here, then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And going further, he fell on his face and stayed and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, he says, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. Oh, my goodness, I can't wait to get to this next week. But the flesh is what? Verse 42, again, the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and uh, and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went and prayed for the third time, saying, the same words. Lord, have mercy. As we approach this text this morning and as we walk into it, there's, a, there's a four things I want to point out in the text that I need you not miss. Don't, notice with me how it opens up. It says, he went with them to a place called Gethsemane. Then he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there with pray and pray. And then after he told them to sit here, he separated the group. Now, don't miss this. Gethsemane 
was um, located within the Mount of Olives. It's a garden that was on the western slope, the lower part of this mountain called it, um, that, that was facing Jerusalem, Mount Olives. And in, in Mount Olive, it was known to have an oil press, and it was a place where olive groves grew. Now, Jesus positioned himself in this place where he was overlooking Jerusalem as he's praying. Now, what's striking to me about the text is that he is left with 11 disciples after Judas, who had betrayed him, was separated from the group. Now, you've got to see this. These disciples have been journeying for a long time. They've been journeying all night. They were no doubt fatigued from their journey. They probably were sleepy from the meal that they just ate. They had spent time doing ministry with Jesus. Then a commentator said they got to the garden. It was probably 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And Jesus, being the Jesus that he is, calls for an all-night prayer meeting. Striking. But what's striking about this situation is when he got to the garden, he positioned his disciples in a certain place, and then out of the 11 that were left, he took three of them, namely Peter, James, and John, and he separates them from the group, and he goes a little further, and he has a different conversation with them than he had with the group. Come on, is this making sense? Now, the reason I'm pointing that out, because I want you to understand with me, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to beseeching God, when it comes to going certain places with God, hear me say this to you. I want to admonish you that you've got to know who your inner circle is. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Everybody that says they're praying for you can't pray for you. Come on, right. Everybody that says, I've got your back. Are you with me? At least Jesus was cognizant enough to recognize. You figured with Judas being gone, that, that, that he was clear with the other 11 because the betrayer and the deceptor had been separated. But Jesus was cognizant enough to realize that I've got to go through some things. I've got to share some things. I've got to get deep. I've got to get personal. And hear me say this. He says, I can't share this with everybody. I need to point that out because you need to know there are going to be times in your life where you you're going to have moments, you're going to have situations, you're going to have circumstances, you're going to have prayer requests that you can't share with everybody. You must have an inner circle because some people will listen to your request for a Facebook post. And next thing you know, the saints have your business all over the place. So I'm saying that to say when we talk about next level prayer, we talk about intimate prayer, you must know who your inner circle is. Are you with me? And, and in case you don't, because I said this earlier, I'll say it again. People who say they have you don't necessarily have you. And don't fool yourself into thinking you're so likable that everyone likes you. Can we be honest this morning? Let's just talk for real, all right? Don't, don't make that mistake because you've got 3,000 friends that you're the most popular person on no, 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 no. Those 3,000 people just like you on Facebook, face them in real life. You better find out who your inner circle is. And if we're going to go there with God, if we're going to get deep with God, we must identify who are the core individuals that we can get naked with, that we can expose ourselves with, that we can go to a place where we are, where we are in desperate need to hear from God, that we can go with them. Repeat after me. Say, self, know your inner circle. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Know your inner circle. Very, very, very important, very, very important that you not miss this because look at the text. Now look at the text, right? He says here, and then taking with him, look at verse 37. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then verse 38 says, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Now, I, I've read that too fast. I've read that too fast because if you're like me and you've been in church a long time, when you read this text, we read it from a spiritual perspective 
And our spirituality prevents us from seeing the depth of what the author is trying to communicate as it relates to what Jesus was saying to his inner circle. Remember with me now, this statement that Jesus is making is not being made in the midst of the 11. Are you hearing me? He has separated himself, and now he has a core that he believes he can trust. Matter of fact, Mark names them Peter, James, and John, the two sons of Zebedee. And now he is alone with this inner circle. He's about to bear his heart out so that they could know how to pray to him. Okay? Now, here's the th second thing I want y'all to take away from the message today, and that's this, okay? It is okay to be human. <laughs> when it comes to prayer. Your voice don't have to change. <laughs> all right, hear me? Hey, you can speak English, all right? You ain't got to go old, old English, these and thou mayest. No, no, no. Yo, G, what's up? It's okay to be human. Come on. Nothing drives me more insane than believers that, that every time you see them, there is nothing wrong with them. They're all perfect. They're all sanctimonious. The life is always together. Just lost their job. And, and oh, hallelujah, thank the Lord. Just been through a crazy divorce. Oh, God is good. Praise God. Can't pay the bill. Oh, God's going to make a way. We know all that. But tell us the truth about where you are in the moment. It's okay to be human when it comes to prayer. And sometimes the church is so spiritual in how we pray that those of us that don't know God like that, we are hesitant to pray because we say we can't pray like that. Can we be real? Watch the text. Watch the text. Watch what the text says. Jesus has Peter, James, and John aside. And then the conversation changes. This was not something he said at the Passover table with the twelve. This was not a conversation he had when they had sung on him and they were going on the way to the Mount of Olives. He finds himself in seclusion with them. And because of his probably trust, relationship, whatever it was he had with them, he felt that it was safe enough for him to be human in their midst. So look at what he says. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he says to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And then he says to do what? Remain and to watch with me. The problem with us really getting the depths of what Jesus says is that our English translations don't do much for us really getting a grasp of the word, right? So, so here's the thing. When you look at that word in the Greek, it's the word periluptos, and here's what it means. Pertaining to be very sad, deeply distressed, very sorrowful, right? So it's like Jesus saying this. Listen, listen to the words that I'm using intentionally. I am so distressed. I am so depressed right now. I am so down right now that I feel like dying. Oh, come on. I know, I know you've heard that before. Here is how, when you look at the psalmist, here's what the psalmist says, saying the same thing. This is where Jesus probably got this word. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? My soul is cast down, he says in verse 6 of chapter 42 in the book of Psalm, within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the harmony in Mount Mizar. Here's what Jesus is saying. Listen, listen, fellas, listen, fellas. I'm at a place right now where I don't know if I can handle what I'm about to face. I'm at a place right now where I feel as if, listen to what I'm saying, depression is stepping in. I'm at a place right now where discouragement is setting in. I'm at a place right now. This is Jesus talking, y'all. I don't know about you. Maybe you've never been there, but I've been there. Come on. There's been times in my life where I didn't feel like I can go on anymore. There's been times when I felt like giving up, when the bills were due, and I didn't know where the money was going to come from. When the wife was thinking about leaving, y'all not here hearing me. I wouldn't praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. No, 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 no. I want to die right now. I want to give up right now. I'm sick right now. It doesn't feel good, and it's okay to be human. Yes. 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 And
and there was nothing these and thou knowest that mayest be in sinners and orchest thou angels. It was none of that coming out. It was God, I'm pissed off. That's how I was. And I couldn't tell that to everybody. I wish I had somebody in here. I needed an inner circle that could bear the weight of my pain. And that's what Jesus did when it came to prayer. He found him an inner circle that he can get butt naked with. And he was not being cute. I want to die, y'all. This is Jesus. This is God incarnate. This is the Son of God showing his humanity. If he were alive today, here's what we would say. Hey, there's mental illness going on. That's what we would say. And the church is afraid of the subject because we're so spiritual. It's okay to be human. Are you hearing me? It's okay to be human when it comes to prayer. It's okay to say I'm hurting. Come on, talk to me. It's okay to say this isn't working out. It's okay to say I'm afraid. It's okay to say I don't know how. It's okay to say I don't see God in this. It's okay to be human. And church folk, quit trying to spiritualize people's humanness. Leave them alone and let them be human for a while. You don't see the disciples talking about, oh, but you're Jesus. They were probably like, dang, you too? Because we were afraid when you call us three and separated us. We thought we were going to die with you, so we were shivering. We're glad to hear you say you're afraid. Turn to them and said, neighbor, it's okay to be human. Yeah, come on, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I got to say that. It's okay because we come to prayer and we don't get desperate to God because we don't know how to take off the spirituality and let the humanity shine out. So our prayers are are all spiritual. Our prayers are, no, 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 no. God, I'm broke down. God, I'm hurting. God, I'm tore up. God, I don't feel good. God, go there sometimes. My kids ain't acting right. Husband's gone. Come on. Just lost my job. Don't know how I'm going to make it. It's okay to be human. Such that when we approach God, there is an authenticity about our petition. Come on, talk to me. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Here's what he said. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. He says here, look at this. He began to be sorrowful. Jesus? And troubled. Jesus, and he said to them, my soul is sorrowful. I'm messed up. He says, it's so bad, I feel like dying right now. Jesus? So here's what I'm going to do about it. I want you all to stay here and watch. We'll pick this up next week, and I'm going to go pray. So look at verse 39. And going a little further... He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Right? So so, so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let me say this before I kind of share this this, this next thing with you, because you've got to get this and you've got to track into what I'm going to say. Jesus was so human. He was so depressed. He was so saddened that Luke in his rendition of this pericope says that God dispatched an angel. Y'all know this. To comfort him because as he was praying, his sweat became as drips of blood. So, so I want you to see Jesus in desperation. I want you to see Jesus crying out. I want you to see Jesus bearing his heart before the Lord. Then he gets to his father and then he makes this statement. Look at, look at what it says. The statement is this. He says, he fell on his face and said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Then he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. Here's how Mark said it in Mark chapter 14. And he said, Abba, Father, 
All things are possible from you. I like Mark because when Jesus told his disciples he was sorrowful, he was depressed, he said, wait here, I'm going to have a talk. And then he gets away and then he pulls the daddy card. I'm a father. And then he says this, I know you and there's nothing you can't do. All things are possible with you. And you've got to hear this through the pain of his concern. You've got to hear this through his concern with the suffering and everything that he was going to go. So he's like, Daddy, there is nothing you cannot do. And then he didn't say, please, it's a command. Handle this. Remove this cup from me. Maybe you've never prayed like that. (laughs) Maybe you've never been through some stuff. There were times, there were times in my life when things got so discouraged. My prayer wasn't, please now, master, please, no, no. It was, God, you better handle this. God, you better take care of this. God, you better remove this. Come on, has anybody ever prayed like that? Lord, you better fix it. Here's what we say, right now, Jesus, in the moment, please, master, and we plead and we petition God, handle this, remove it now. But then watch what he says, nevertheless. Listen to this, y'all. Watch this. Our relationship with the Father empowers us to pray for the desires of our heart, comma, providing we submit our desires to God's will. I got to say this. If Jesus can go to his Father with the concerns that he had, it says to me that I have permission to show up in the presence of God and be human. Come on, y'all. Come on. Talk to me this morning. I have permission to go in the presence of God and be human. So I can go to God and for a moment I can forget Bible. I know that sounds so blasphemous to some of y'all. Isn't that what Jesus did? Because the word was you're going to die. The word was you're going to be suffered. The word was you're going to go through. But here's how he approached. Hold up. I don't feel good right now. I know what the word says, but it ain't manifesting. It's, I wish I had somebody in my life. It, it ain't, you you, you kind of get where I'm going? It doesn't feel good. So I can go to God in my humanness, and I can say to him, Lord, I am hurting. Lord, I need this, God. I am good. This is where I find myself. You have permission to be human before God and let him know what you want. Yeah. You've got permission. Caveat. Don't expect that because you want it, he's going to do it. Are you hearing me this morning? You want to be in line with the will of God. But hear me say this. You have permission to be naked before God. Because here's what we do. We've got secret sins. I can't go to God with that. Got a secret He already knows. (laughs) So you might as well just tell him because he'll tell you if you don't tell him. Right? (laughs) You want to know why you feel convicted when you walk around? Yeah, that that conviction you feel, it ain't you telling yourself. It's him telling you that I know what you did. Come on. (laughs) That's what conviction is all about. It's him telling you what you did. So if I'm you, God, here I am. And make it known. Put it out there. Put it out. You've got permission. You've got permission. Providing you submit to his will. So here's a couple of things. Here's a couple of things and we're going to move on, right? A few things I want you to get away. So so there's nothing wrong with praying whatever our heart desires is. And lock into this. Not everything that's possible is part of God's will. Here's Jesus. Everything is possible for you. Fix what I'm feeling right now. Fix what I'm going through right now. And the text responds by saying it was not God, part of God's will. Are we going to talk about that, right? Here's the other thing. Prayer is not designed to cause our personal desires to override God's will. This was my introduction. Fast all you want. Pray all you want if it's not God's will. Need I tell you about David when he had that Sheba, and the child was born, and the child got sick, and the child was about to die. Look at how much he prayed. Look at how much he 
rented his garment, sackcloth and ashes, yet and still, God did what God was going to do. Does this make sense? Come on, say amen if you're here. Okay? Look at this last one. If Christ had to guard his own requests by submitting it to God's will, how dare we ever try to pray for anything without adding, if it be your will? Say it differently. If Jesus, God's very son, if Jesus, God incarnated in flesh, had to submit his desires to what God wanted, who in the world do I think I am to think I can place a demand on God? Are you hearing me? Who in the world do I think that I am? So look at the text. We're almost there. Look at the text. Let me share one more thing with you. It says here, going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this, what's the word? Cup pass from me. But nevertheless, he says, not as I will, but as you will. Here's what you need to know about that cup. Here's what Jesus was really concerned about at the core of the issue. The cup in the Bible days or in the Old Testament is a metaphor for suffering, saying that I'm going to have to suffer a lot. So when he looked in the cup, he saw all the beatings he would have to endure. When he looked in the cup, he saw nails going through his hands and nails going through his feet. When he looked in the cup, he saw a crown of thorns on his head. He saw himself having to carry that cross through the dusty road of Calvary. He saw himself being marched from judgment hall to judgment hall. He saw himself being pierced in the side. When he looked in the cup, he saw my sins and he saw your sins. When he looked in the cup, he saw himself bearing all the sins of the world. And more importantly, when he looked in the cup, he saw his daddy turning his back on him because his daddy could not bear the weight of his sin. And he he says, hold up, that draws the line. God, if it is possible, do this differently. <sighs> I can't handle that. But then watch this. But then he says this, not my will, but whose? Imagine if we can learn that as a people. Imagine if we can learn that as a community. Imagine if we can learn that as a body of believers. And our goal is to consistently walk in the will of God. Now watch this, and then we're going to pick this up next week. I'm going to skip verses 40. I'm going to skip verses 41, because we'll talk about that next week. And then look at verse 42. So here's what happens in 40 and 41. He prays. Commentator said he was probably praying for about an hour or so. He goes back. <laughs> smiling because his inner circle fell asleep. We'll pick that up next week. He reprimands them or encourages them, and then he goes back a second time to pray. And then verse 42 says, again, the second time he went away and prayed. And watch the prayer. Watch the prayer. Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So it's almost as if between verses 40 and 42, God answered the prayer, and he knew what the answer was. And so when he goes back, he doesn't say, my soul is troubled. Changes. He doesn't say, if it's possible, take this away. He comes back and he says, okay, that's how you want to do it? Cool with me. And he goes about and does it. Let me, let me, let me, just, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Here's all I want to say. Every prayer request should be submitted to the will of God. When God answers, make the adjustments to his will. This is me. Oh, you want to go there? I was hoping we'd go here. I'll tell you what. I'm going to go ahead and go here. Because I think I know more than you. All right? I'll catch you on the rebound. Why don't you just meet me over there? Because I'm going that way. And then he does meet us over there. But the problem is we're in jail over there. <laughs> he does meet us. Come on now. 
or he does meet us over there. The fact is we got an illeg- illegitimate child. Or we've got something crazy going on because of what we did because we didn't adjust to his will. Make it easy. When we pray and he responds, be like Jesus. That's how you want to do it. I'm good. Let's do it together. And we adjust to his will. You kind of get what I'm saying? So here's the thought I want you to walk away from here with. Is that when praying... Make the adjustment to God's will. Every prayer ought to end like this. Lord, I know what I want. But I want what I want to align with what you want to do. It prevents you from heartache. It prevents us from failures, from turning our back against God. It protects us from a whole lot of stuff. Right? And here's the good news in that because here's what Jesus said. Oh, you want me to die? Okay, we're going to do it like that. I'm good. You want me to suffer? I'm good. We're going to do it like that. Oh, you want me to be pierced in the side? Okay. You want them to scandalize my name? Okay. You want them to talk about me? Okay, we can do it like that. Because here's the good news, is that if God can allow you to be killed, scandalized, persecuted, suffer, talk about that, just like Jesus, three days later, he can raise you up. Come on, isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? That if we are willing to suffer with him, he can raise him up. Because here's how the Bible says in Romans 8 and 28, right? In all things, God does what? He works for the good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. So in the end, regardless of the process, as long as we adjust to God when praying, it works out. For his good. So I don't know about you. In prayer, I'm choosing the easy road. And here's an underlying message that's not explicitly stated. Sometimes in prayer, it's not deliverance from, it's strength to make it through. You got to be okay with that. You got to be okay with that. Right? Because I know a lot of us are tired of being broke, tired of being beat down, tired of being all that stuff. But if God can take you through, he can bring you out. When praying, always submit to God's will. Are you hearing me this morning? Okay. So say it with me. Say, when praying, praying. make the adjustment adjustment. to God's will. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Neighbor. when praying, praying. make the adjustment adjustment. to God's will. Let us pray. Father, you're wonderful. God, you're gracious. God, you're merciful. God, you're kind. God, you are phenomenal. We thank you for the richness of your word, God. And sometimes, like Jesus, we don't understand it all. Sometimes, like Jesus, we can't process it all in the moment. But we know you're there with us, God. We know that you have us. We know that you can carry us. We know you can deliver us, God. So we thank you for that. We thank you for who you are. As we learn more about prayer and we've become a church of prayer and we're desperate and crying out to you, God, speak, continue to speak, God. Even as we go to the table this morning, God, we have to make the adjustment to your will. We have to make the adjustment to your will. We have to make the adjustment to your will. We have personal desires. We have all of that stuff, but we must make the adjustment to your will. So thank you for your word. Continue to teach us. Continue to mold us. Continue to make us. Continue to shape us, God, to be more of who you would have us to be. Oh, how we love you. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we magnify your name. So, God, as we prepare to come to the table this morning, God, we give our hearts to you. We give our time to you, God. We remember Calvary. We remember what you did. We remember who you are. You're a great Father, God. You're a good Father, God. You love us and we love you. Teach us to make the adjustment to your will. We worship you, God, in the beauty of your holiness. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen.